thanks Franco for the intro. Uh, I did want to just add a little bit on my background that uh, previous to this I was a co-founder at a startup and we were using Couchbase Lite uh, in our iOS app. We leveraged the fact that um, since we were doing a CRM system, we'd had multiple sales associates that needed to be looking at the same customers and have that data synced across all the sales associate devices. So it was actually a perfect fit. Um, okay, so let's uh, jump into it. First, a over overview of the webinar. Uh, let's understand the overall problem. Talk about a overview of the JSON Anywhere solution that we're putting forward. And then we'll dive into Couchbase Lite for Android specifically, which will assume some familiarity with Android, but hopefully not too much. If you want to follow along, you'll need to have Android Studio installed and running. And then we'll talk about where to go from here. So bird's eye view of the problem. A typical app today is extremely data rich. You probably have a few apps in your pocket that fit this criteria. Uh, I have one that I use called Human, which is kind of like a Fitbit app, and it's collecting tons of data, location data, uh, accelerate, accelerometer data, and that's just one example. Uh, this data, by default, by nature, uh, in its sort of natural form, is largely unstructured. And if you wanted to try to fit it into a structure such as relational structure, it's actually probably more work than just leaving it in its natural structure. Uh, and J JSON is perfect for this, uh, to model this natural structure, but then you run into the problem, um, how do you build a mobile app using standard tools like SQLite or Core Data when you've got all your data stored in JSON? So what we think the solution is, is what we're calling JSON Anywhere. So under the green arrow, we've got the Couchbase server, which is a clustered JSON database, and it's got a proven track record, and it, it, it scales. In the middle tier, we've got JSON on the wire, and we use Sync Gateway for that, which is essentially an adapter between Couchbase server and the final tier which is Couchbase Lite, which is a JSON database on the device. So that's the sort of architectural overview that you should keep in mind through the whole presentation. The, the Couchbase Lite is not just a standalone database. It's, it's connected into this, whole, into this whole picture, which is your typical app is, you know, you've got it connected to the cloud and you've got um, a native app running on the edge. So let's talk about Couchbase Lite on Android. And what we're going to be talking, what we're going to be going through is an installation and a setup walkthrough, a live demo of the Grocery Sync sample app. Then we'll dive into the Grocery Sync code, and we'll talk about the API, the document model, and how to formulate queries. So let's go through the installation setup. What we're going to need to do is clone the Grocery Sync Android repository, then import it into Android Studio, and then run it. So here's how to clone the Grocery Sync Android repository. It, this, this actually includes the Grocery Sync demo itself, and it will pull the Couchbase Lite core modules that it needs. So it's um, uh, the, the tricky part here is you'll need to, after you do the clone, which is straightforward, you'll need to switch to the native API branch, uh, and then you'll need to init and update the submodules. And just as a disclaimer, this, this is going to be easier once we have our next release and it will be a little bit better packaged, but I wanted to demo the native API to give a, um, a, um, a, a better picture of how this is going to look once we go uh, GA with this release. So if you're not familiar with Android Studio, uh, what happens when you launch it is it will have this welcome screen. And what you'll want to do is import the project. 
that will prompt you for which directory you want to import. And so you'll want to navigate to the Grocery Sneak Android folder that you cloned in the previous step. Then it will ask you if you want to auto import, which won't be checked. So you'll need to make sure to check that. And then you want to leave uh, use default Gradle wrapper as, as checked. Once you do that, you should end up with a screen like this and you'll have a, uh, a tree on the left which will contain the Grocery Sync Android code as well as the CB Lite uh, library code. And then to run it, you can hit the run button uh, on the top and that should launch the emulator. This, uh, if you've never used Android Studio and you haven't defined a uh, emulator or what they call Android virtual device, you'll need to do that too. Uh, I'm not going to go through that, but it's, it's very straightforward. Once you, once you run it, you will be presented with an emulator screen like this. So this is the empty Grocery Sync app with uh, no data. Okay, so now we'll go through the live demo. Um, this is actually going to be a pseudo live demo. I'm going to demo this off a recording I made earlier today. The uh, reason being I'm um, having issues with Mavericks uh, conflicting with our webinar software. So let me switch over to the recording. Okay, just make that full screen. Okay, so here I've got Android, I've got the Grocery Sync project open in Android Studio. And I'm going to go ahead and hit the um, run button. That's going to kick off a build and it will fire it up in the emulator. So actually, it's, at that screen, it's prompting me for which emulator to use. Uh, you could also use a device. Okay, so here's the emulator home screen and now it's launching the app. So I will add a new grocery item to the list. And now I'm going to pause the video and, and explain the next step a little bit. So if you remember back to the original slide with the full architecture, you've got the, uh, on the back end, you've got Couchbase server and the sync gateway. And essentially what's happening in this demo is that this database is, is linked up to a Couchbase server database and all changes made to the Grocery Sync database will get synced up to the Couchbase server database. So to demonstrate that that's happening, um, I'm going to run a couple commands against the sync gateway. The sync gateway is like a store, uh, sh uh, store nothing tier. It, it essentially is like a window into what's stored on Couchbase server. I could also pull up the Couchbase server UI and look at the documents there, but it's, it's a little bit easier to look through uh, the sync area for this demo. So I'll be running a command line HTTP call. Uh, so this, this is going to go against port 4985. So I've got a sync gateway running locally uh, in the other tab. And I'm going to port 4985 because that's the admin port. Uh, that admin port only works if you're connecting through localhost, and it exposes uh, the full sync gateway REST API, and it also it won't prompt me for security uh, because it's going through the admin port. So I'll be querying the grocery sync database, uh, and then I will be asking for all docs, which will give me the complete list of docs. So it started out as empty, and now that I've added a doc to Grocery Sync, as long as that doc is synced over to Sync Gateway, we should see it in the in the all docs um, response. So let's go ahead and run that query. Okay, so what we get back is a list of rows which contains a single document and it has the ID of that document. So to actually take a look at the document, we're going to copy and paste 
that um, document ID and build another URL that does a get uh, with the database and the document uh, ID. Okay, so what comes back is the actual, this is the actual JSON document that was created in the Grocery Sync app. And as you can see, it's got the shaving cream as the text field, and the check field is set to false. So let's go ahead and actually um, check off that item in, in the emulator. So I'm going to go check shaving cream. And then we'll go back to the sync gateway and take another look at that same document. And now you can see that check has been set to true. So essentially every change is mirrored. So last thing we'll try is to delete that item from the grocery sync. And then we'll go take a look at Sync Gateway. And that item is now returning a 404 not found. If we redo the all docs query, it's now returning no documents. And so that thing was, that delete was synced up to Couchbase server as well. And we can see that by looking at Sync Gateway. So we'll go back to the presentation. And just as a quick recap of what we saw, we were able to create, update, and delete records in the in the local database of Grocery Sync, and we verify that documents were synced to Couchbase Server by looking at the Sync Gateway. Okay, so <clears throat> now let's take a tour of the <clears throat> of the actual code. So this is how you initialize Couchbase Lite. You create a new CBL manager object and you pass it the directory where you want it to create your database. Uh, in this case, we're getting that directory by calling the get application context, which is an Android API call, and then the get files dir on top of that. <clears throat> if we wanted to put it in a subdirectory, we could we could add it in the path at this point. Okay, so let's talk about what the CBL manager is and how it relates to the whole architecture. So you can think of the CBL manager as kind of a singleton, like that's your that's your entry point into the API. And a CBL manager holds a collection of CBL databases. And each database holds a collection of documents. This is what an individual document looks like, and this should, this is exactly what we saw in the uh, sync gateway output. So you've got a list of fields. This can be arbitrarily nested. You can also have uh, attachments. So here's shown, uh, which was not part of the demo, but it could have been uh, to have an image attachment associated with that record. So going back to the manager, it's a collection of named databases. On Android, there's actually not a real compelling use case to have multiple managers. So you, you can pretty much think of it like a singleton. And that's essentially an artifact of the iOS port, but we decided to add that flexibility to Android too in case there, there, a use case arises for that. And the manager's responsibility is to manage the database storage in the in the directory. So the database, um, before we go too deep into this, I want to say that you want to think of this as uh, a quote unquote real database. And it's not just a wrapper around a cloud service. So you can use it standalone and it has a lot of powerful facilities. Uh, like views and the ability to do queries. It's essentially a namespace for documents. So you cannot have two uh, d document IDs in the same database. The database contains the views and their indexes. It contains validation functions, which, which are very useful when you want to keep your database clean. So you 
a validation function is something that you would provide as an application programmer and you can set uh, restrictions on records that go into the database and if if those records do not um, do not match the validation function it will reject it and I, I actually use this heavily at, at um, uh, on another app I was working on which we would find bugs and we would see that you know records were being sort of like changed in unexpected and undesirable ways and it was it was easier to add a validation function uh, than to track down the bug. So we, we ended up doing both. We'd add the validation function which would prevent that data from getting in and then we would track down the root cause. Um, but we'd have that sort of contract uh, going forward that we couldn't make those same kind of mistakes on the documents because of the validation function. And then databases are also uh, serve as the source and target of a replication. And we'll get into replications later. So a document has, uh, as I mentioned, has a unique ID within the database. It can contain an arbitrary JSON object. The only restriction is that you can't have a key that starts with an underscore. There's no enforced schema. You, you can have any sort of schema you want and it can be arbitrarily nested. So you can have a dictionary with a field that has a list and each list item is a dictionary all the way down. Denormalization is is okay in in NoSQL. It's kind of a no-no and relational, so it's a little bit of a mental shift. Um, and I'm not going to go too deep into this, but I think uh, you know if if you have any questions, you can you can always ask uh, during the webinar. Uh, there's a chat box or there's also we you know at the end we'll get to the resources, but we've got a support forums and uh, GitHub uh, issue trackers if you run into problems with that. Documents can contain binary attachments, so essentially the canonical example would be an image attachment. Um, there's no restriction on the size, and they can be tagged with a MIME type, so you could put a Word document in there if you needed to. Documents are versioned using multi-version concurrency control. Uh, the biggest thing you want to know about this is you it's very painful if you try to build this yourself. The, the main thing it does is it enables conflict resolution uh, when you're syncing because these documents can be edited uh, offline on different devices and then there's got to be a way to uh, you know, deal with the conflicts if if multiple edits have been made on the same document on different places. The we keep internally we keep a revision ID history, and every update to the document will create a new revision ID. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about views and queries. So each view is associated with a database and a database can have multiple views. The view is essentially defined by a map function which we'll discuss in detail. And you could think of a view index looking something like this, like a table with keys, values, and uh, the keys and the values are emitted, are emitted from your map function and the document ID is um, that's emitted by the framework. It's kind of like an internal hidden field that it's in, that's in the view. But essentially with that document ID for every view row, you can get back to the original document. And when you do a query, you're essentially taking a slice of the view. So if you did a query with no parameters, no start key or end key, you would get you would get the entire view. If you provide, like in this example, it the start key of 2013-09-30 is being provided, and the end key is 2013-10-17. Uh, that's defining the sort of boundaries of the query, and it's very efficient because it's 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 already the view is already pre-sorted and it's 
it stays sorted. And so when you do a query, you're essentially just grabbing a chunk of the view. So what are views? Uh, views are a map, are, they're defined by a map reduce mechanism, which is a standard method of indexing in NoSQL. You can think of it as similar to the index in a relational database. The application defined map function will be called on every document, and you can emit arbitrary key values, key value pairs in the index. So by arbitrary, that means you don't have to just use a string. You can use you can use an array. Um, you can also use more uh, more complex structures. So, uh, and, and for a value, it, it can just literally be any JSON. You can optionally provide a reduce function, which is useful for uh, data ag aggregation or grouping. And the map reduce functions that you provide are basically native callbacks that you register. Uh, native callbacks make sense for performance and since the rest of your code base is already in that native code, um, it's the most natural way to do things. We, we, I will mention that we do have an ability to register uh, JavaScript callbacks as well. Okay, so here's how you would create a map function um, and apply that to a view. So you call the set map method on the view and you provide an anonymous class and it will have to um, implement or override the, um, the map method that takes the document in the form of a, of a hash map of, of um, string keys and object values and then it will pass you an emitter which is the object that you will call to emit your values into the view. So in the grocery sink example, um, we are getting the created at, uh, which is just the field that represents the time it was created. And as long as it's not null, uh, we will emit as the key uh, created at after being called, after two string is called on it. And then uh, the value will just emit the entire document itself. Okay, so going deeper into queries, um, there's a pretty basic feature set. You've got key ranges, offsets, and limits. You can reverse the query. You can group the results by key. You don't have joins or some of the like uh, secondary sorting, but you can you can do this by using you can accomplish most of this by using compound keys and being clever about the way you emit things. We provide a live query subclass which monitors a view for changes uh, in like a pub sub approach. So you'll um, after you create a query, you'll register a callback that gets triggered whenever the uh, query changes. Th this is great because this allow I mean this this sort of promotes good MVC development where the uh, the views can just uh, monitor the models and and be automatically refreshed. So this is what a live query would look like. So you have your view index on the left with a few records and you have a CBL query that sort of defines that result set. That CBL query gets wrapped in a live query and whenever this result set changes in any way such as, uh, for example, if, if a new record was added with the key of 2013-10-05, which would, um, you know, become the new second row, that will trigger the live query to call back your function and your function could refresh the list adapter or list view adapter 
which would show show the new set of rows in in the UI. So in grocery sync in the grocery sync demo, this is how we set up our live query. We create a query on the view. Uh, we're not giving it any um, start key or end key. We're essentially asking for all the rows in that view. Then we're converting it to a live query. Once we have the live query, we add our change listener, which is our callback, and that will get called the on live query change method will get called back, and it will be passed a CBL query enumerator, which wraps the query result. From there, we we get the full set of rows from the query enumerator, um, which is not that efficient if you if you wanted to to do uh, you know, if you had a, a large number of rows, you probably want to go about that a little bit smarter. Um, and then we update the um, we update the UI, which which I'm not showing this code in this code sample, but it's very straightforward. When, once you have the rows, to um, update the UI, and we run that on the UI thread because any any UI element, um, uh, this callback is going to be running on a couch-based light thread, and the uh, to update the UI element, you're going to need to run on the UI thread. And in the very last line, we go ahead and Start this query, which is which is going to kick off a, a background thread, um, and so this uh, the live query start call will return immediately, but that will kick off the query running in the background. It, it will call these callbacks on it when appropriate. Okay, so this is what gets called back in your list adapter. You will be passed a position parameter and from that you can call uh, you can get the CBL query row object from the CBL query row you can get the document and from the document you'll call get current revision dot get property with with the field name of the document to get that property so in this case it's the uh, text field which which in the document I created earlier that's what had the shaving cream text. The other thing we're doing down here is we're, ch we're getting the check property and we're showing the appropriate image. And then we add that label with the uh, text property and the icon, add that to the um, item view, and then we return it. So responding to taps. This is what gets called when, when you try to check off an item. So it will get the CBL query row. Again, a position field is going to be passed in in this callback. And we call adapter view get item at position to get the query row at that position. Then we will call uh, row get document to get the actual document. And then to update the properties, we'll call get properties on the document, which will return an unmodifiable hash map. We'll create a new hash map from that existing hash map, which we can modify. Then we'll edit the uh, check property to be the opposite of what it currently is, which is essentially toggle that check. And so if it was unchecked, it will now be checked or vice versa. And then we'll call document put properties on that new hash map, which will uh, durably um, update that document and, and persist it on disk. Uh, note that we don't, uh, we don't have to trigger the UI to be changed in this code because that's where the lab query comes in. It will automatically detect documents been changed it will redo that query and then update the UI. So to add a new item, we call database.createDocument, which will create a, a blank document. 
Then we'll create a hash map with all the fields in the document. Uh, we'll set the ID to um, a random UUID that was calculated above. We will set the text to whatever the user typed in. We'll default the check to false, and then we'll set the created at as the current time. Then we'll call document put property, which is the same API call in the last slide when we updated it, and that will persist, that will save the document and persist it. To delete an item, it's very straightforward. We, we just get the uh, row at that position in the adapter view that they long clicked. Then we get the document from that row, and then we call delete on the document. So let's jump into uh, sync. So on a high level, you've got your database, and then you've got these replication objects, which are part of the Couchbase Lite. And each replication object has a direction associated with with it. So it can be either a push or a pull. It can't be both. They're they're decoupled. Um, so you can have a pull without a push and vice versa. Typically, you'll want both, but there's a lot of use cases where you may just want one or the other. The other thing a replication has is a remote URL. Um, so that's the URL of the sync gateway, which was that middle tier from that initial diagram. And then... Um, <clears throat> Depending on the, on the authentication method that you're using, you'll uh, need to provide some sort of token. We've got some sample code which we won't go into here, but we do have um, we do have support for Facebook-based authentication, uh, Mozilla Persona-based authentication, and um, you can do you can define custom authentication um, in, on. A, on your own server. The replication objects will notify your code whenever things change, whenever it state change, like the state changes, like it starts or stops, or it will notify you of progress. And we'll, we'll look at some code behind that uh, in the next couple slides. Okay, so here's how you create replications. We've got this uh, sync URL, which is a constant, and that's essentially just a URL string. From that, we call database get pull replication. We pass that sync URL. This will create a new replication if one does not already exist for that URL, um, or it will return you an existing pull replication for that URL. Once we have the pull replication object, <clears throat> we call set continuous on it. And with, what that does, uh, I'll go into a little bit later, but essentially you've got one shot or continuous replication. So in, in our case, we want it to, to run continuously. We repeat the same steps, but this time for the push replication. So this is actually what took effect in the demo was the push replication because it was pushing from the grocery sync database to the Couchbase server uh, slash sync gateway. So we also want continuous uh, on that. And then we add observers on both the pull and the push replication so we get notified of any uh, of any changes and then we call start on these replications which will get them running in the background so the start method runs asynchronously as i mentioned each each replication is is unidirectional it's either a push or a pull but not both so the behavior can be either one shot or continuous. So a one shot replication will completely stop when it's after it completes, meaning it, it grabs all the documents 
or it pushes all the documents. A continuous is probably a more common use case uh, and that keeps monitoring changes until the app quits. The replicator runs in its own thread in the background. It can, um, it will be, when we go, when we release, it will be able to detect uh, online and offline changes and it will handle connection errors. This right now is kind of a, a little bit of a work in progress. It, it doesn't, I'd be lying to you if I said it did that already on the Android version. The, the iOS wor version works fine. So you probably have to write your own code to uh, monitor when, when it goes um, offline and restart it. And um, your code will, will essentially get um, notifications when, mainly when queries have changed uh, and when documents have changed as a result of the replicator updating the database. So again, like the publish subscribe approach. And then you can, you can observe properties on the replicator through the observer observable pattern. And we'll look at some code on that. So this is, this is how you monitor a replication, or this is actually, the, this is the callback on the, uh, on your observer when a replication changes. So first you're going to need to cast it to a CBL replicator object. Then you can call uh, various API calls on the replicator such as uh, is running to give it, uh, to find out its state. And you can also call get changes process, which will tell you uh, the total number of changes it's processed so far. And then you can call get changes total, which will return the total number of changes it thinks it has to push or pull. And just just a caveat here, this can this can be a little uh, complicated to deal with because the way the replicator works is that it will sometimes the, the way it works in batches, that changes total is actually a moving target. So we'll think it needs to replicate, you know, X documents. And then uh, after it gets partly into the replication, it will think it needs to replicate Y documents. And so it's actually kind of tricky to show a spinny here. Um, sometimes it kind of goes backwards in, in terms of progress because the, the total is a moving target. Uh, but it, it it does give the you know if you if you did a spinny without an actual pro, like without an actual percentage uh, it would it, you can at least tell when this when this number is moving and the replicator is progressing. Okay, so that's it for the uh, code walkthrough. So now I'll try to get you started on like where to go from here if you want to get up and running with Couchbase Lite. The first, uh, I, I want to make a digression here about uh, Couchbase Cloud. So what this is, is is a developer sandbox that we've created to make it as easy as possible to get up and running on mobile. So going back to that initial architecture overview diagram, these two tiers, uh, the Couchbase server and the Sync Gateway, Rather than having to set those up yourself, uh, with a few clicks in Couchbase Cloud, you can get a URL that you can use that will that will act as these two tiers um, that you can plug into your app and start playing with. So the um, the Couchbase Cloud is available at www.couchbasecloud.com. Uh, it's free, so it's it's um, it's out there. It's free. It's it's not production ready, so you'll have to. It, it's great for getting up and running quickly, but if you want to go to production, you're going to need to set up um, a a Couchbase server and a Sync Gateway, but this is—it's essentially the fastest way to experiment with Couchbase Cloud, uh, Couchbase Lite. 
So what else you'll need is to download the Grocery Sync example from GitHub. Uh, here's the URL, and you can also refer to the earlier slides in the webinar. And then you'll essentially just need to uh, follow the in instructions in this webinar, which walk you through how to get it, get it built and running on the emulator. We have a very, very vibrant uh, Couchbase-like community. So our official homepage is mobile.couchbase.com. We also have a very active Google group, which uh, which is which users are using for questions and uh, bug reports and and just getting help up and running. And then finally, we have a all, all this. All the code is 100% open source, uh, Apache 2 licensed, and it's available up on GitHub. So uh, this is the URL for the Couchbase Lite Android GitHub repo, and you can file tickets. We've got quite a few users that are filing tickets and um, actually improving the code base and sending pull requests. Okay. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you need to, my contact information is um, is on this slide, and you can contact me directly, uh, or you can go through the uh, Google group uh, on the previous slide. So I'll now open things up for questions. Perfect. Thank you, Tron, for this great presentation. We have a, a lot of questions coming in, so we will try to cover as many as possible. But for those questions that we are not able to answer uh, live, we will have a, a blog on Tron's profile where he will answer all the questions, and we will also answer those questions uh, privately offline. So first question from uh, Yosekin. You mentioned at the beginning about the next release that is going to come. When will be the date of release approximately? So our next beta release is going to be uh, December 13th. Okay. Thank you. And then we have a GA, our official GA release is scheduled for uh, first quarter next year. Great. So another question from William. How does Hector fit into this picture? So initially we, we used Ektorp as a replacement for having a native API. And essentially Ektorp sits um, it sits on top of the REST API. It, it's, it's a way to access the REST API. Uh, we're kind of, we're, we're essentially going away from that and we're encouraging people to, to use the native API, which matches the uh, iOS side of things. However, our, we're, we're planning to sort of unofficially support Ektorp and we're hoping that a, you know, community member or members will step up to, to maintain Ektorp um, and keep it going. It should actually be easy to maintain because the REST API is stable. And so the only reason that the Ektorp, um, the Ektorp API would need to actually change is if the REST API changed. And it's, it's not really undergoing a lot of changes. Perfect. Thank you. So another question that we have is, is the Couchbase Sync Gateway completely compatible to CouchDB? So um, there are some differences. It's it's largely compatible. Um, I think for the the purposes of Couchbase Lite, it is it is uh, it is completely compatible. So if you find something where you are trying to sync with um, CouchDB and it doesn't work, and then you try it against Sync Gateway and it does work. That's a ticket that you, you know, that's essentially a bug that we'll fix. Perfect. Thank you. Um, a question from Jim. Can you go briefly into the conflict resolution system? I know this is a large, uh, sure. answer, yeah, yeah, very long answer, but maybe in a no, no, it, it, it's actually very easy to explain briefly. Uh, I'll give you the example of, um, you know, from my background, from from a CRM app, you'll get a conflict if you've got uh, two two sales associates 
let's say, um, I mean, you can imagine this scenario where um, a sales associate is in a store, they're, they're both looking at a customer, uh, Jim, and um, let's say uh, they're, they're, they're currently offline because they're, they're both out of Wi-Fi. And the, you, you can think of the, they're both looking at sort of record, uh, revision ID um, 25 of Jim. And they both simultaneously change, or it doesn't have to be simultaneously, but let's say be, in the time before they get back online, they both happen to change this record. And so you'll have one sales associate, um, let's say uh, uh, Denise has changed Jim uh, to uh, to have re to create revision 26 by updating his phone number. And then Rhonda on the other side of the building has updated Jim uh, to update his address and she also creates revision 26. So what happens is eventually when they get back online and they try to sync, they need to become consistent. And so the way it works is it will actually pick, so this is just like a straight up conflict. There, there, there's um, you know, you, you can't pick one or the uh, over the other uh, based on any sort of um, like there's no there's no right answer there's no winner there's no clear cut winner so what it does is it deterministically uh, picks one of the um, one of the one of the updates so let's say it picks Denise's update and it doesn't throw away Rhonda's update it stores that in re, in the revision tree and then it marks the document as as being in conflict. And when I say deterministically uh, picks, it's, uh, you could think of it as kind of randomly, like it picks them arbitrarily, but it's not randomly because it's, it, it, uses a, it uses an algorithm. It essentially takes the hash code of the content and then it compares the hash code to see which has a higher sort, which, which is like um, just the, the sort order of that hash code, it just compares them. And uh, and then it picks the highest one, and so it's deterministic in the sense that if you run this uh, algorithm, I mean, it will always give the same answer for these for these two revisions because the the algorithm is predictable. So going back to our scenario, it picked Denise's change it, it, and threw away uh, Rhonda's change, or it didn't throw away; it sort of stored it in the revision tree, and now your application has the opportunity, your application can see that this document is in conflict. So it can do one of two things. It can completely ignore it and do nothing, and that's actually fine. So it won't cause any problems, um, and the only problem you might you run into is that Rhonda might come and complain and say, hey, where I changed to his address, and now that got thrown away, what happened? So if that's an issue for you, um, you can, your application can detect these conflicts and do whatever it wants and then there's an API call um, to um, basically update the document and you can, re you can pick the other one that wasn't picked or you can merge the two changes together which would be the most, you know, in this case that would be the most logical thing. Um, you could detect the conflicts, see that they were both changing different fields and then actually merge them without even um, without even telling the user. And if or if they did change the same field, in that case, uh, you would want to present to the user like, okay, this other sales associate changed the same phone number, uh, and it, and it conflicts with your change. What do you want to do? Or maybe a sales manager would get notified and have to step in and manually resolve the conflict. But all the machinery is there. Um, uh, for that to work. Okay, thank you, Tron. Um, another question is, can I use Eclipse for development? So you can. Uh, unfortunately, Eclipse is being treated uh, is currently a second-class citizen. Uh, we're really hoping that someone in the community will step up and um, help help with the Eclipse support because you know we are aware that pe some people. Um, you know, are mandated to use certain IDEs, and 
obviously Eclipse is uh, is still the more widely uh, deployed IDE. We, in our official release, in our official beta release, we provided a uh, jar files which should be able to be dropped straight into Eclipse. And um, I, I definitely expect uh, this to be evolved and improved. So right now the Eclipse support is, you know, you're, you're going to face a little bit of an uphill battle, especially if you want to run the latest code or a different branch. But um, I expect I expect this to be improved as as we hone our processes and also we get um, community contributions on this. Thank you. A question from Jill. Can we replicate peer-to-peer -peer between two devices? So, in theory, yes, and in practice, it's it's not that well supported at this point, and it has some secure. So, since since it's not the most typical use case, although it's it's not like a total unheard of use case, but it's um it's sort of taking a backseat, but but luckily the the architecture is such that it's a multi-master architecture, so there's nothing in the actual architecture that's preventing this. Uh, the security ramification uh, I mentioned is right now uh, to do peer-to-peer -peer replication, you'd have to run the um, Couchbase Lite listener module, and unfortunately <clears throat> that <clears throat> that doesn't have a security model right now, so if you run that listener module, you're going to be opening up that port and anybody can connect to it, uh, other applications or whatever, whatever, things on other machines, and there's no there's no security. So there's, a, there's that huge security caveat. So uh, the good news is we actually have a community member uh, who's jumped in recently who's tackling that problem. So maybe by our... Uh, next beta release or the next webinar we give, uh, I'll be able to say that that we've solved that problem and we'll be um, one step closer to peer-to-peer um, -to -peer replication. Great. Thank you, Tron. Um, so we have a follow-up question from Yosekin on your Ektorp answer. So in the answer to the Ektorp question, you said Ektorp is on top of the REST API. So the REST API is always part of Couchbase Lite and what Couchbase Lite listener then? So um, it gets a little complicated. We maybe we should follow up um, with a with a Google group discussion on this, so we can do some diagrams. But you the the REST API is essentially um, baked into the code. You, you uh, so Ektorp doesn't actually use a listener to talk to the REST API. It uses a special URI that. Um, like CB light colon forward slash forward slash and so that that actually um, it, um, it short circuits the URL machinery and then the other thing it does is it passes in an, an HTTP client um, to or it basically uh, ectorp is given an HTTP client that calls back directly into the rest API without going over sockets so you can you you can in theory emulate that in your own code if you want to write code that uses the REST API but doesn't use a listener, that is uh, that's definitely possible using the same the same approach that we use we use for Ektorp. So yeah, thank you. Um, another question from Steven. So which version of the Android API level is required? So we're actually at um, API version 9 right now. So we were a little bit higher, uh, and we act, and this is a great example of where a community member jumped in, um, reported the bug, sent me a pull request, and and now we're we're down to APA level 9, which I don't know the ex exact stats, but I think it's 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 that covers over 95% of the Android um, deploys out there, or maybe maybe closer to 98. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from uh, Robert: Is Couchbase Lite thread safe? So yes. So um, it's 
you you shouldn't really have to worry about any threading issues uh, other than when you're talking to the to the um, Android UI component. Uh, the replications run on their their own background threads, and there are also um, there are also methods provided where it makes it easier to do things asynchronously uh, rather than having to, let's say, spawn your own thread or manage a, a thread pool for things that you want to happen asynchronously. But having said that, you don't have to use those. You can, um, you can call the synchronous methods and um, manage your own threads um, in your own code. Great. Thanks again, Tron. Um, another question is, what is the upper limit on attachments? So there's no, uh, there's there's actually no upper limit on the Couchbase Lite side of the code. If you're using Couchbase Server on the back end, uh, I believe the upper limit's uh, 20 megabytes for for attachments. Great. Um, Another question is, so you said there is still an issue with online offline at the moment. How does replication handle online offline uh, right now? So right now um, it will it will do a it will do a back off algorithm. Um, and so the, the the problem you'll see right now is if if it goes offline, it will do a back off algorithm, and then um, it might go into uh, a state where it's just trying to do it's trying to do the replication um, every five minutes. I, I forget what the upper ceiling there is, but it's it's kind of a long time period. Uh, and so, when it comes back online, there'll be this uh, lengthy delay before the replication will actually kick in because it's um, it's done this back off algorithm. And so, what we need to do is to detect when it comes back online using um, one of the available Android APIs. And once it's back online, we will uh, trigger any replications that are waiting for that. And, and we'll have that done by the, uh, by the GA release. But for this current beta, uh, we don't have that yet. Awesome. Thank you, Tron. We have time for one last question from David. How do I get more details about how to model my data or create views? Yeah, so if you're coming from the uh, relational world, this, this is going to be a, uh, a, a large mental shift. Uh, we do have a webinar. We, have a, we had a previous webinar, uh, what was it called, in-depth? Um, On in indexing views? Yeah, um, so I would check out that webinar because, uh, or, or also the, um, that webinar and, and on the Couchbase Lite iOS webinar went into detail on that as well. The the other best resources is if you um, if you dig deep in the documentation, it's covered a bit there. And then you know again, the Google group is is the best place to to ask. If you're stuck, you'll you know you'll get a response in you know a day or two max, probably even faster. Uh, I forgot to mention we also have an IRC channel that um, a couple of the developers uh, tend to hang out in. And a, a lot of times what will happen is if you ask this question, you know, if, if you pose your issue that you're running into on sort of advanced document modeling, that can turn into, um, that, that can turn into documentation uh, or even we might think about doing a, a dedicated webinar to that. Thank you. Yeah, as Tron said, we have, uh, um, for those of you who are interested in the Couchbase server side, we have an uh, a online training that we do every week. Uh, it's a four session, Couchbase 101, 102, 103, and 104. And the Couchbase 104 is the one that is related to uh, indexing and views. If you go on couchbase.com uh, slash webinars, you can see the recorded version of this training. And as uh, again, as a reminder, next week on Tuesday, we will have a uh, our uh, webinar on PhoneGap, which is a joint webinar with uh, Adobe. So those of you who are interested in this plugin, uh, we will send the, the link to register tomorrow in our follow-up email. Um, this is all we have for today. Thank you, Tron, for the presentation, and thank you all for joining us. I hope to see you again next Tuesday.